few small hours of our time, let's go to Richard Johnson, lecturer in US politics at Lancaster University. Richard, welcome to you. An hour and 20 in duration. Did you manage to stay awake through it all? I must admit that I watched it earlier this morning. Um, it was the second longest in uh, US history. The, the State of the Union has been a tradition that goes back to George Washington, but it was Woodrow Wilson who revived it as an in-person speech. Uh, previous presidents had objected to it as resembling too much a state opening of parliament. So uh, in the last hundred years, this was the second longest delivery. Uh, before we get on to what was actually in the speech, on the point about how much it matters, as you say, there's this great historical continuum is part of that, but actually for a, for a person who sets, you could say, the news agenda through his tweets, old-fashioned speeches don't really figure. No, it's not the normal Donald Trump um, setting, but, uh, you know, this reminds me a lot of the speech that he gave to the joint session of Congress. It wasn't called a State of the Union, but it was very similar in format to a State of the Union in the first hundred days of his presidency. And I think what was so notable about this speech was that it was Donald Trump embracing his status as, by and large, an orthodox Republican president. Uh, that, and that, in many ways, is an echo of his previous speech to the Joint Session of Congress, which uh, many viewed as sort of a pivot away from the kind of Bannonism uh, that had marked the, the very start of his presidency. And I think it'll be interesting to see how much he continues to act in the mould of a Republican president. But the Republicans in Congress last night were clearly very happy with the president. But that's the key point, Richard, isn't it? How long he does it for? Because it appears he's got a willingness to vacillate in terms of his approach, and it's more akin to the way some, you could argue, say the Chinese address a foreign audience, and they'll go back to a domestic audience, and you look at the message and it's completely different. And therefore it might be folly for us to look at his speech and think, oh, here's a new Trump, when actually what he's giving you is the Trump of the day, uh, and it'll be a different message for a different audience the next day. Well, I think we have to continue to remind ourselves to look at the, the substance of the president, uh, what he's achieved as, as president, what he hasn't achieved as president, and, and try and look beyond the, the sort of chaotic bluster of Trump the entertainer. He is, of course, an entertainer by background, and so he is able to sort of, you know, confuse and, and, and surprise us from that perspective. But in terms of what he's been doing as president, the, the tax bill, he repealed the individual mandate in uh, President, Obama health, president Obama's health care legislation, uh, he's repealed a great deal of regulatory um, framework, in the, particularly when it comes to energy and environment. These are very traditional, substantive Republican objectives. And, and, and so from, from that perspective, you know, I think that you know, this speech might be the, 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 the substantive yeah. Trump rather Richard, than the, the entertaining the, the, Trump. The, the way you chronicle that first year, it, it, I mean, it is shades of Ronald Reagan. Well, I think that he, uh, I mean, Reagan was also an entertainer. He had a slightly smoother approach than, uh, than, than Donald Trump did. But I think that the, the comparison is not entirely unmerited. One, one point to note from the uh, uh, speech last night, um, Donald Trump was at his strongest when he brought in uh, examples of American heroes and spoke about American heroism. And this was a tradition that began with Ronald Reagan in 1982, when he brought a, a person called Lenny Sputnik, who had saved someone from drowning. And his sort of presidents have continued to do this ever since. And Trump's speech was full of references to these heroes, which he had uh, seated in the gallery. And that's a bit of, that's a bit of showmanship. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I think that there is there's a comparison to be made with Reagan. And we saw, we saw the choreography with the, um, the refugee, the asylum seeker, uh, I think from, from North Korea as well. So that stage manager, that choreography is there. Was it choreographed when he got the booze on for his immigration co comments, or is that from the heart of, of Democrats? I think that seemed to be a more visceral reaction from Democratic members. They thought it was notable that you could see uh, the Democratic leader in the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, sort of half get out of her seat and try and hush uh, Democratic members who were uh, sort of scoffing at the president. I mean, I think is, it's what is that rare, said is, that, is that rare to have booing like that at a City Union address? It, it's rare, but it's becoming more common. President Obama was, was notably heckled by a Republican uh, House member from South Carolina who shouted, you lie, in a joint, uh, speed, uh, joint address to a Congress over health care. Um, and, 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 and last year, I seem to remember in the joint address to Congress, there were moments where Nancy Pelosi 
um, also has tried to, uh, or, or perhaps it was Chuck Schumer, has have tried to sort of calm down Democratic members. You know, it, it is, in many ways, uh, it is a kind of state opening of Parliament for the United States. Woodrow Wilson, who revived it, was a great scholar and admirer of the British Constitution. Um, and so that, you know, it's... It, in that sense, it's meant to be a, a moment of the head of state as much as the head of government um, speaking to, to Congress and the American public. Uh, we're going to be talking, Richard, in a, in a few minutes to the director of Reprieve about Guantanamo Bay. There was um, President Trump saying, we're going to keep it open. 56% uh, at least, according to the most recent poll of Americans, agree with him. I mean, there is that sense in which, you know, for all the restrual condemnation from, <clears throat> from without America within, there remains a base that seems uh, unflinching in its support for his policies. Yeah, I think you know. I think he does have a, a substantial base that is remaining with him. You know, his approval is at forty percent, and although that's low for a first-year president, uh, presidents have been re-elected uh, with going. You know, with four, you know, forty. They can work up from forty percent. President Obama, uh, when he was re-elected in twenty twelve. Uh, was re-elected after having uh, approval ratings of, of, of a similar level. You know, on Guantanamo, it's a symbolic move. It was one of the first, perhaps it was even the first executive order that President Obama signed in 2009 to close Guantanamo Bay. He had whittled it down to 41 prisoners out of, I think, about a total of 800 who had been processed through. He was, he was looking for countries to accept those final prisoners. The U.S. Congress had blocked him from transferring them to the United States. And so, yes, this was uh, a way of uh, Trump signaling another repudiation of the, uh, of the Obama legacy, as, as he saw. Uh, Richard from Lancaster University, appreciate your time. Thanks very much.